Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, so my name is David Kramer. Uh, I'm going to talk about some simple solutions to uh, scaling kind of common patterns that I see everywhere in apps. Um, a little bit of history about me. I am the creator of Sentry. Uh, how many of you use Sentry? Hmm, need more hands for this. Uh, so Sentry is just an error logging platform. Um, it's built in Django. Um, but it's now kind of a thing that supports every language and really grown into this big ecosystem. Uh, I used to work for Discuss, which is a big comment platform on the internet. Um, I ran infrastructure there for three years. And I just recently joined a new startup called 10xer where we're trying to measure productivity of engineers using data mining. Um, so first, what do we mean by scale? This is kind of a, a misconception that a lot of people have. Like, there's, there's big scale, like Twitter scale and Facebook scale, but that's not necessarily the same as what we're going to talk about today. And more importantly, the scale of various projects uh, that I'm going to describe are actually really similar. So like, Discuss has a lot of traffic. Um, I think it, it's tens of thousands of requests a second to their application servers. Uh, they get like a billion, page, uh, billion, I think, unique users a month across the network. So it's just an enormous amount of traffic into the system. Whereas Sentry isn't a lot of traffic, but it's a lot of uh, write traffic. So we're doing a lot of writes to, to the, uh, the databases and to the system. So it's kind of a different kind of scale, but it's still something where we have to think about things. And then 10x or neither has a lot of traffic or a lot of uh, write throughput, but it has a lot of data. Uh, I think we already have more than a terabyte of data, and we have just a small amount of users. So the things I'm going to talk about today, the question is, like, can you take some of these practices and can you use them? Does one size fit all? Are they applicable to other projects? And I think they are. Um, and starting with the database, how are you going to store your data? A lot of people talk about NoSQL. Uh, I don't really care about NoSQL. Um, Postgres drives everything it discusses. Most people are never going to see the scale that Discuss does. And 100% of the data lives there. We, it's read actively through every request. Um, we're using MySQL for a hackish implementation of a graph database at 10xer. Facebook does exactly the same thing. There's no complex solutions there. And Sentry will run on any SQL backend. If you try really hard, it'll even run on SQLite. And it'll actually like, scale to some extent on SQLite. So like, the takeaway is let's stick with like, traditional solutions. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, on the basis that we want to use SQL and that we want the power of SQL, which there's a lot of it. Um, however, to do that, we have to come up with a lot of compromises. And the one thing I want you to think about today is that scaling is just about predictability, like to know how the system's going to react and how it can grow. So we can uh, kind of fix the SQL problem by uh, augmenting it with various technologies. And my favorite out of all of them is Redis. We use Redis for so many various things it discussed, like a majority of Sentry runs on Redis. Um, and there's, there's many other solutions. Like I assume many people have used Memcache. Uh, there's some up and coming technologies like Cassandra. Uh, we were trying that out at Discuss, but we were never actually storing the main data set. We were using it to store like analytics data or something that was kind of outside of the bands of our, our main databases. Uh, and React's also another really interesting one that, that does a distributed model really well for you. Um, but today I'm just going to talk about solutions using Redis because it's the easiest technology you can possibly imagine. Everything's a simple data structure. It's a, a list or a hash or a set or a counter. It, it requires very little knowledge to get started. It's very easy to run. And all of these solutions, I hope, are, are very simple. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is counters. Uh, I assume if any of you do web apps, you probably have counters somewhere. And depending on what kind of counter, like, it might be fine just to query the database and ask like, how many of whatever it is is in there. But a lot of times, that's not true. Um, some examples, and like Sentry, for example, keeps a count of how many times an event's been seen. And that could be millions of times in a small period of uh, a, a short span of time. And you can't really just say, hey, database, can you count the number of events in there? First, because if, if we had those million events in there and we were having to count those over and over, it would be very slow. And secondly, we don't actually store millions of events in there. We just store the count. Um, many other examples. These are all simples. Like 10xer has stats everywhere. Every single stat is just a counter. Um, uh, like discuss, we have the, the number of likes you've received. Twitter has the number of followers you have. These are all just simple counters. So it's a very common thing that you can use everywhere. Uh, in SQL, 
I assume if you've ever used SQL, you know what this is, and it's simply you're saying increment the counter by one. It's an atomic operation. It, you don't have to worry about race conditions or anything. You just say counter is the old value plus one. Uh, Redis is, it is more or less exactly the same. You just say increment the counter by one. And if you're familiar with memcache, it actually has an inker command. And the reason I really like Redis is because you can call inker on a key that doesn't exist. And this is actually really, really important and a huge performance benefit. Because if you were to do this in memcache, you basically have to say, there, there's two approaches. Either A, you get the value, and then if the value doesn't exist, you uh, inker or you set it. And if the value does exist, you inker it, which is really annoying because then you have a race if you're like distributing the, the, uh, the work logic elsewhere. Um, and there's another solution, but either way, whenever you do this in something like memcache, you have to do two operations over the network, whereas Redis is just a single increment operation. So um, a good example of this, and I don't know if this is really legible. Um, so the way counters work in Sentry is we basically have, there's events that come into the system, and then they go into this Redis counter. Like we basically just do an inker in Redis, and then eventually that gets flushed to the database. And we kind of use these as buffers, and it's, it's been like the life and blood of Sentry. This is 100% of how Sentry scales its throughput. Um, so like I said, we do the inker, uh, and then we have a queue that's set up, and it basically says, like, in 10 seconds, take the, the inkers that are in Redis and flush those to the database. And the way it does that is when the task gets run, it fires a task every time an inker comes in. When the task gets run, it does a git and a delete on the Redis key, which is atomic because you can pipeline commands in Redis, so they'll just run as a bulk operation. So what this does is the first process that gets this actually gets the counter and flushes it, and then every other task that might come in, we don't have to worry about because it's going to see that the value is now zero and it's just going to return immediately. And the, the biggest thing here and the most important thing here and why we do this in Redis instead of just incrementing the counter in the database is Redis is all in memory and very, very fast, whereas the database, if you were doing the, the counter equal counter plus one, you're going to have a contention writing in the, uh, on that individual row. So, like, like, the way the writes work in the database, it's just like a queue of, like, first come, first serve, and they all have to go in order to some extent. With this, like, Redis has the same thing, but the writes are so fast because it doesn't have to deal with any of these compliance issues that the database does that we can just stuff it all in there and then uh, extract it out uh, right to the database. Um, there's some, some good things and a couple of actually really bad things about our current solution. Uh, so the big thing is it eliminates that row lock contention that I was talking about. Um, Redis, fortunately, because we're using it as a buffer, if like, we can't fit everything in memory on one node, we can just add another Redis server. And it's fine to just add it in there because this is all temporary data. And it's very easy to implement. Like, if, if you want to see an example of this, just look at the Sentry source code. It's, it's very clear how it works. Um, and then the one big negative here is that we end up with a lot of tasks that do absolutely nothing. So we're just wasting a lot of CPU cycles. And we kind of uh, approached solving this by doing a, an alternative solution where we use sorted sets in Redis. And a sorted set is basically like a set in Python, except it also has another like, list associated with it that says the order of items in there. And you can basically have uh, a key. So the key in our case is going to be an event. Um, this is like the event hash. And then it's going to have a score, which is just the number of times it's been seen. So instead of incrementing the Redis counter, we increment uh, the counter in the sorted set. Uh, this is very similar to the previous one, except instead of uh, firing a task every time, we actually use cron or some other scheduler and say every 10 seconds we're going to flush all of those events, we're going to flush every single counter that's coming, and we're going to fire off tasks for that. Um, and this describes a little bit more of it, I, I won't go into too many details, but um, it basically solves that wasting CPU cycles kind of thing, and it still handles a fully distributed workload. Um, now the biggest thing here is, uh, that you're going to have to store all pending updates in a single Redis key um, if you did the simple design. But you can still fan it out to multiple databases or multiple Redis nodes by just having multiple of these keys, like one per node. And then you just have to step through each key. It makes it a little bit more complicated, but like, ideally, especially even for Sentry's workload, like, you could do all this on a single Redis server. Um, another big one is activity streams. And the most obvious example you can imagine of this is Facebook. But, I think this is another thing that people confuse, like what activity streams really are. And like they're, they're so common. Like the Facebook example is like very easy to understand. It's an activity stream. But um, we have this thing in Discuss. The, there's a giant page that you moderate your comments on. So it's like I'm going to list all the uh, pending comments that I need to approve or 
mark as spam or something. And that's actually just an activity stream. It's just like we're showing a stream of all the comments that are in there. It's just not quite the same thing that you would understand like as if it were Facebook. So this is kind of how we implement it in Sentry again. It's a simple SQL model just to, to give you an idea of what a stream might look like. Um, it just, we have a type of event and then we have various metadata like who the event belongs to and when it happened. Um, in the end you'll have a bunch of things, that just simple events like this event happened or you deployed some code or something. Just very, very obvious things. And if you think about this more, all this is is a cache of what's actually going on. It's a view. And more specifically it's what we call a materialized view. These are uh, unfortunately very complicated to implement at scale. Um, but you can definitely do them with, in fixed bounds. So in Python, uh, if you were going to implement something like this, you would just have a list and you would be inserting things at the top of the list and maybe you trim the list because you want it to be a fixed size. And again, you want it to be a fixed size because you want everything to be predictable. And if, if you can have like, if your Twitter, for example, and your stream is just all the comment, or all the tweets rather, and you're Justin Bieber and you like tweet at everyone every five minutes or something and you have all these followers, all of a sudden like all their streams are going to explode and be huge and like you don't really want that because now you have the issue of no longer is your system predictable and you can have hot spots everywhere because like imagine if you just had a list of followers on Justin Bieber and he has like, I don't know, 20 million or something. 20 million followers. That means like his key space is going to be 20 million entries whereas like I have 7,000. So if you can kind of normalize those patterns to where you only need a subset of that data then like it becomes much easier to scale out. Um, and a Redis actually can do this very well. Um, it's a lot more complicated than counters, but you can use those same sorted sets. Um, in this case, in a sorted set, we're going to use uh, the event ID as the key, and the score is just going to be the timestamp. So that means like when we pull events out, they're going to be sorted by the, uh, the time they happened. And then again, like because we want it to be predictable, we need a set of max size. Again, the, the power of Redis is that you can pipeline commands. So in this case, like we're actually adding it to the set with zadd, and then we're trimming the set with this uh, zrem range command. So all in one operation, like it's actually doing this atomically, adding the item and flushing or like trimming the tail of the set. So then we have a, a very predictable sized uh, timeline stored in Redis. Um, one of the other big things that, uh, like I would hope everybody does queuing already. Um, maybe you leave with some ideas uh, how to improve it from here, but this is like the backbone of any, any really scalable web application. Unfortunately, in the Python world, uh, we have Celery. Uh, how many of you already use Celery? It's very, very easy to set up, especially with Django. Um, I think it works just about everywhere now in the Python world. And the reason I really like Celery and not some of the other tools is because it gives me somewhat freedom of choice. Like, I specifically run RabbitMQ in production. Discuss runs RabbitMQ. Um, I, I think most companies don't actually use Redis or one of these more lightweight things in production as their queuing software. And there's various reasons for it. But my main reason is that Rabbit is a very, very good queue for persistence and throughput. And actually, I mean, just doing the job is a queue, right? Whereas Redis, it can do it, but like the way it's implemented is kind of hackish and there are limitations to it. Um, but the nice thing here is that, like, I may run RabbitMQ in production, which is not hard to set up, but it's not the easiest thing to set up. And in development, I can actually run Redis because the abstraction is very clean and the, um, the constraints that we work under, like, there's no special features that we're using between Redis and between RabbitMQ. So it makes our development environment much more lightweight when we can swap that in. Um, tasks are super easy to create. And a task is just a unit of work in Celery. So it's just a decorator. Um, we actually explicitly bind to queues, and I'll explain why in a minute. But um, in this case, we're firing the task by calling dot delay on the function, and then the task is just going to incur this counter, right? So it's very simple. Um, now let's let's take a more realistic and uh, kind of similar to how Sentry works example. So same thing, we're going to fire this this on event creation thing, and what that's going to actually do is it's going to go into this event creation queue, and then that's going to fire off several jobs increment counters. When when an event happens in Sentry. Like, it may increment 100 counters. So it's very important that we can actually distribute that work and not just have one task that's incrementing all of them. And now the, the important thing here is we're actually incrementing the counters in a different queue. And the way, the way Celery works, and actually, like, if you have a much more complex architecture, like, you may want servers that just run from, like, this counters queue because it's really fast and you have a very consistent pattern here. And then maybe you want servers that run this event creation queue because it's a little bit slower or something. 
And more importantly, like, you don't want a lot of events coming into the system to stop you from being able to process those counters. So you want to be able to spread out that work to where it makes sense. Um, and if, if you take nothing else away today, uh, keep your jobs very small. This example that I, I'm showing here, like the jobs are pretty small. These, like code is much more complex uh, than this in practice. But the bigger your job is, you're, you're just going to have a bad time. Um, an example is, let's say I have this activity stream and I need to add, I need to backfill it. Like I need to migrate all my data into it. And for whatever reason, that means I need to take all of the events in my system and I need to call this add event function on it. So in this case, this is using like the Django Orem. We're pulling down all of the events, we're looping through them, and then we're calling add event. So we're doing all this in one process. So even if it's in the queue, it doesn't really matter at this point. It's not going to help us. It's, it's actually going to block that queue process. Um, now a better way, and this is actually something we're doing a lot at 10xer now, is to actually break this up. So this is performing the exact same functionality, except it's doing it in a really good way. So what happens is you fire this job, and then it's going to fetch the first thousand objects from the database. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into details how that's like implementation specific, but what it does is it'll fetch a thousand, it'll come back, and it's like, all right, I have these thousand. Now I'm going to fire a job for each one of those. So again, I'm not, I'm not sitting in the same process doing this. And then it's, it's going to do a simple check to see if it should continue, and then when it goes on, it's just going to fire the same job with a, a next like cursor offset. And this actually makes it really, really easy to kind of go through a lot of data in a really predictable fashion. There's some issues with this um, in the sense that if you're delaying jobs in here, like you might have a huge spike in your queue because it's probably not going to be able to keep up with these add events, whereas when all your task is doing is going through like SQL rows and dumping them into the queue, it should be very fast. So you'll probably end up with like a queue having, you know, a huge amount of items, whereas the queue that's just generating those items is very small. But um, like when you have something like Rabbit, it actually handles that very well. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is object caching. Um, this is kind of generic caching, uh, but it's, I, I think a lot of people use caching to fix slow code. And if you cache slow code, it doesn't actually help anything because the code's still slow and the code still has to execute at some point. So the best solution there is just to fix the code. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is actually object caching, which is something that we've done pretty commonly to scale out reads. Um, there's kind of the saying I live by now, and that's that read slaves are very bad on databases because as soon as you need a read slave to scale out your load, you're already in trouble. Like, there's no coming back from that. Um, so some prerequisites before you even should consider caching, like I'm about to describe, is if your database can't handle the level of read load that's coming in, um, if your data changes infrequently, this isn't really a requirement, but you're going to get more value out of it if the data is not constantly changing, and if you can handle slightly slower responses. Um, so the way this might work, you could actually do this with Redis as well, it's just I'm going to illustrate with memcache because it's simpler. Um, maybe we have a memcache cluster, and we're actually storing every event that comes in into that memcache cluster in its own key. And what this does is it lets us actually have a very quick hash table to pull out objects and see their current state. And this is actually important, like, imagine I had a, a materialized view of the, the latest five events. And now, I, I don't actually know what's in that view, right? But maybe my system is really, really, really critical on being able to remove an event everywhere from the system. So in this case, like, the canonical source for data will be in this object cache. So I can pull the event. So, sorry, um, my view has five items in it, right? The view is actually just going to be five IDs. And when I get those five IDs, I pull the five events from the object cache. And then if one of those is deleted in the object cache, I know that that view is no longer valid or that I should not show that event. And that makes it so you can very easily and very quickly invalidate data across your entire cluster. Um, so this is a little bit more code. It's probably hard to read. Um, but the gist is, uh, this is very, very easy to do. Um, memcache provides a git multi, and Redis provides, it might provide a git multi, but you can just pipeline gits, so you could execute like 10 gits in a row on the server and it would do the same thing. Um, but the gist is we're just gonna, you know, map the, the object IDs to keys and then we're gonna git multi those, pull them back. If any of them are misses, like if they're not found in the cache, um, there's a couple, a couple like solutions to this. So we're like, we're gonna assume that if an object is not in the cache, it just is missing from the cache, like the cache is expired. So in this case, like any object that's missing from the cache, we're gonna query the database for afterwards and then we're gonna write it back into the cache so any future requests don't have that problem. Um, and this is actually like, 
if you use Django or any of the, the actual model based ORMs, like it's very easy to, to implement sort of system wide solutions to take advantage of some of these properties. Um, and it gets very easy because what you can do is you can overload like the save and delete hooks. So in this case, like in Django, we might, we might overload, or overload save or we might hook into a signal, but whenever we save, we're just gonna push that into the cache. And ideally, like unless you're, like the cache is gonna have a correct enough representation of the data because it should be the newest form of it. Even like if you have multiple people like trying to save the same thing at the same time, it, it should be correct enough. Um, and then delete. There's actually a couple options here, and this is something to consider if you ever do anything like this. When you delete an object, you can either delete it from the cache, or you can set a tombstone that says this object's been deleted. Now this is kind of tricky because you need to decide like, when I'm reading my objects, am I expecting deleted items to exist somewhere in the system? If I am, I don't want to query the database for a deleted item when I know it's deleted, so maybe my, my function that returns all the objects that are uh, from the cache actually looks for these deleted tombstones and it knows if it finds one that that object just no longer exists and it doesn't have to worry about it. Um, so, you know, I talked a lot about solutions and stuff. Uh, I want to talk about, like, why these are important and some of the steps you, you go to to make these happen. So, everyone at Discuss may not agree with me here, but uh, I think one of the largest problems we had was our moderation panel. And it's just this giant view of complexity. So, for example, um, if, you are a dis if you're a Discuss publisher, so if you're like CNN.com, for example, you may have like 10 websites under the CNN branch. And we, uh, basically what we do is we have this moderation that says, give me all comments that are made on these 10 websites because you're a moderator of these 10 websites. And the problem with that is that query is actually very complex and hard to optimize. And then even more so on top of that, we have various ways you can view like, only in approved comments, you can view pending comments or spam comments or deleted comments. So there's all these different ways that you can query the data, which actually makes it very, very hard to optimize this. Another example of a mistake we made was our API. Uh, we have um, methods to like get all the comments back. And one of those methods would like let you say, well, I want all the comments for these five websites and, you know, I only want approved comments or approved and deleted comments. So we gave users too much choice. And there wasn't actually a lot of value in giving them that choice. We just, we did it because it was easy, right? And this came back to like hurt a lot because we could not optimize these endpoints. Like, and more importantly, when you're trying to distribute data to systems, like you can't easily just say, well, I need all the data from a bunch of random places that have no direct path to them. So this, this caused a lot of problems. And like the takeaway from this was be more mindful of what you're doing. Like plan ahead a little bit. Like is this gonna cause a problem in a long, in the long term. And some examples of this, and I, I'd like to say we did Sentry a lot better than uh, we did a lot of other things because we were kind of planning for certain things. Um, Sentry has this concept of a team dashboard. So Sentry works, there's a team, and a team can have many projects. The team dashboard is the only place that shows any data team-wide. And what it does is it shows a simple graph, which is easy to, to cache somewhere, to denormalize, and it shows a couple of like lists of like five items, of like the newest events and the, the most important events. And all of those are very, very, very easy to, to denormalize into like a materialized view. And that's completely intentional. Like we could add many other features, but as soon as you hit any kind of scaling issue, those features are gonna be really hard to support. Um, the stream view only shows a single project's data. And this means that we could actually take projects and we could just, we could map them to different databases, which means we could have different hardware running here and here and here, which means we could scale out much easier. And th this is very intentional as well. Like, many people would constantly ask, like, well, why can you not view a stream view for all of the projects, like, in a team? Well, simply put, it's just, like, we don't want to deal with the consequences of implementing that feature when that feature is really slow or has problems. Um, another really, really important one, and this is probably the most important, is pre-allocating resources. So Redis is awesome, but it must fit in memory. Like, you, it has some disk persistence and some other things, but you can't actually buffer from the disk. So your entire data set 100% has to fit in memory. And this is like, it's kind of okay depending on your workload, but it discussed, for example, like, there's no way we could fit all of our counters and all of our sets in memory. It's just too much. So we'd have many, many servers running Redis, right? And the way we would do this 
is we'd actually plan ahead and we'd have a, we'd have like a Redis cluster of 64 machines or whatever. And they'd actually just be virtual machines. Like we'd run one physical machine and it would have like 32 uh, individual Redis instances on it. And now the big thing from this was like all of a sudden you need to scale and that physical machine is running low on memory. You have two choices. You can either upgrade the machine or you can move the data somewhere. Now if you had a single Redis node or a single database even, like a SQL database, to migrate that data means you have to read it all in and you have to write it out in the correct sources so that the, the new code can take advantage of it. And this is actually the main reason people uh, are fans of tools like Cassandra and React is because they try to solve that problem for you. But that problem can be avoided and minimized if you plan ahead. So in this case, when we run the virtual, uh, the many virtual Redis instances, we do it because when we need more memory, we don't want to upgrade the server. We bring up a new server and we just migrate the half of the databases to the new server. And this means potentially, like, for whatever you pre-allocate, you can run up to n times whatever the maximum hardware in existence is. And I will tell you that you will never keep up with the hardware. Hardware grows very fast. Discuss runs, uh, I think, a t uh, it's close to a terabyte of memory in their database servers now. And they run, like, pure SSDs on them and this is uncharted. This is all the data living on one node. And if you could imagine that they had split this up to begin with and they, they had planned for this, like, if you had 100 machines with a terabyte of memory, it's very hard to exhaust that for, for normal data. Um, so some takeaways. And these are kind of like, I would say I've learned a lot um, at my time at Discuss and I learned a lot building things like Sentry and doing various things. Um, the biggest one is that all these, these fads for all these other databases don't really matter. Postgres is the best database out there right now. It's, it's very advanced. It's growing very fast. It's, it, it scales just fine if you understand your, your problem and you prepare for it. So while like, we might augment things, like we might use Redis on top of it or we might use Cassandra here and there, like, we still trust the databases to do their job because they do it very well. Um, queue everything, literally like anything that doesn't need to be done, just stuff into a queue. And if you start this from like early on, it becomes much easier to scale. Like people talk a lot about the clouds, but the cloud is only good if you can actually scale out servers. And you can't just spin up database servers and then magically scale your data layer. Like that doesn't happen. The only thing that happens is you can scale out your worker nodes. And those might be web nodes, but ideally they're actually queue workers. Um, and this is the biggest thing, and people ask a lot about this, is like learn to say no and rethink features. And a lot of people ask like how you convince like a product manager to be like, oh yeah, it's okay that we don't have this feature. I mean, it, it comes down to like a give and take relationship. And I think most people I've worked with are understanding that some problems are very hard. And if you can explain to people like, it, it's like, well, if we can have this feature and if we could just do like, we could cripple it just a tiny bit over here, maybe one less thing that's less important, it would make things so much better. Like people are very willing to give into that. And I, I think that's the big, big takeaway. And the, the biggest thing that I learned at Discuss is you're going to be constantly maintaining stuff if you cannot rethink features and plan better. And uh, complex problems do not require complex solutions. All of these Redis examples, like, like, I am not like a distributed database person or anything. I just am a hacker. And these are all really simple things. And they're re actually really common solutions to things. And this is how everybody scrapes by. And it's, it works just fine. When it doesn't, like, hopefully you're extremely successful and there's better things to worry about. But, um, like, the simple solution is honestly, like, almost always the better solution. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you guys for having me here. Taiwan's been awesome. Really enjoyed the conference and the food. How uh, does anybody have any questions? So, uh, thanks for the excellent share, and uh, I'd like to know uh, how do you encounter the problem of tweaking Rabbian Q uh, for the scale uh, issue? How to make RabbitMQ scale better? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, do you uh, encounter this problem? So, there's a few things. Um, I think Discuss, we didn't even have to worry about clustering it. Like, one RabbitMQ server can do a lot. And the biggest thing is you want a lot of memory on your RabbitMQ server because while it can persist a disk and you don't need as much memory as you have data, as soon as things cannot fit in memory, it's going to be a lot slower, especially if you have a lot of jobs coming in and a lot of jobs coming out because you're going to have like a lot of I.O. Um, 
And so I actually recently upgraded uh, Sentry servers based on some research. Um, we allocate 90% of the memory on a server to RabbitMQ, and then we run SSDs now. Um, I believe Discuss is similar. They just have a lot more memory. But um, if that doesn't scale, then my solution would be to have multiple RabbitMQ servers and just route things to various places. OK, guys, thank you. Anybody else? OK. Thank you, guys.